next speaker is uh, claire uh, claire peribula she is managing director the e lab asia pacific uh, the e lab asia pacific is involved in investing accelerating and scaling impactful and sustainable sustainable edtech innovation across asia pacific and the world claire recognized as a pioneer and change agent skilled in driving significant increase in profitability by leveraging business synergies and innovation to build new companies and corporate lines of business uh, floor is your clear and we look forward to have an engaging session with you thank you thank you deepak thank you so much everybody for welcoming me here today um i i love the word pioneer it connotes like me be really really old riding like a wagon across to the west <laughs> pioneering the forefront i feel like that some days yeah so uh, you know i i i really appreciate this opportunity to to um be in this this woman ag tech forum I, you know as deepak mentioned i'm claire perbula i'm the managing director of the yield lab asia pacific which is an early stage ag tech fund doing series a seed investment as part of the federation of the yield lab funds in north america europe latin america and now asia pacific we have 57 ag tech investments globally um when i you know i kind of did some uh, uh soul searching when i thought about introducing myself um uh, one reason is because i've i've never done any all women anything so so <laughs> so so this was this was kind of a first um uh and uh let me just get myself at least teed up here um and uh when i started thinking about you know Uh, the session i i immediately said yes you know women in egg speaking on women in egg event absolutely and then i saw that was going to be going out as a post that said uh uh th that we were rock stars and so immediately i called deepak because i don't think most women no matter how significant their accomplishments would consider themselves a rock star unless they were truly like a rock star you know singing and you know madonna like um we are a very exacting gender we shy away from singular accolades of any type so i i, I reminded him you know i i'm not a plant scientist i don't have my phd in genetics you know he said that's okay he knew this so so um this woman in egg event caused me to think a few things since i've never been it's it's kind of phenomenal to be as old as i am and to have never been on a all woman anything I've never been on an all woman panel. I've never been in an all woman leadership team. I've never been in an all woman organization until actually <laughs> the fund that we're in now. Um and, and to the contrary, uh it's always I've always been the only woman doing whatever I've been doing for the past 30 plus years, which then prompted me to think about my journey. How did I end up here? You know, this moment and and what if any was my role in the evolution of industry which then caused me to rethink about how I introduce myself. Uh I'm sure the the women here and Deepak <laughs> uh actually have have introduced themselves many many times and I think we all get into a bit of a rut into how we introduce ourselves. We tend to grab the relevant measurable highlights, we leave out those low lights and uh which are probably the most interesting. and we just give palatable easy to consume sound bites of our measurable accomplishments um but it's it's actually those low lights which are usually what put our careers on a certain trajectory or cause our careers to pivot into what we've become i know that's been true for me uh so normally i would introduce myself as having been in the technology industry for the past 30 years creating new businesses in the technology industry for large multinationals. I pass over my early years and start the clock from when I came to Asia Pacific with IBM 20 years ago. How I was hired to create a new innovation out of IBM research and supply chain, which at that time was the next inefficient part of industry in need of innovation. I always pass over how I ended up in the technology industry in the first place which is a story of its own and needs more time than this 30 minutes so perhaps a different time and a different setting yeah because it's filled with lots of highs and low lights but one common thread that has existed across my career 
is I've always been focused on creating new businesses using newly created innovation to drive out costs, increase competitiveness, eliminating inefficiencies, you know, doing more with less. Um, as technology innovation has moved across industry and enterprises have gone from where I started my career, which was the early days of uh, the shared software applications, which was the early version of what we called software as a service, except you had one computer and one backup computer for that, for that software. To, to data center outsourcing, to business process outsourcing, to enabling supply chain constituents to collaborate and optimize, and then creating B2B marketplaces so that all could communicate and collaborate and share information with an industry and across all members of trade. I did several roles with IBM in creating new businesses for them and then, then went to SAP, became part of the leadership team for Asia Pacific building and leading a 220 million euro partner organization. And, and then after that, the next area of inefficiency was marketing. You know, So as we follow industry and we look at how we can drive uh, inefficiencies out of industry, um, my former boss at EDS became the CEO of Axiom and they were transforming marketing spend into something measurable, getting a 360 degree view of the consumer, being able to predict what the consumer was going to want before they want it using BI, business intelligence and analytics. And then I met and began advising two co-founders who were doing something really innovative in China, creating social listening, algorithms, machine learning, analytics, disruptive to traditional media, disruptive to advertising, product testing, disruptive to consumer research. So I decided to go in on, on a startup, uh, which was my first time ever. It was hard work. Uh, early stage venture capital was not as prevalent in Asia Pacific 10 years ago as it is now. We had to work hard for everything, every customer, every investment dollar, constantly reevaluating our strategy. And during that journey, my back and forth to St. Louis to drive this business while caring, I'm originally from St. Louis, um, while caring for my mother who had developed Parkinson's caused me to meet one of the top executives at Monsanto. Uh, this first meeting then turned into Monsanto becoming our largest customer and brought me into the agribusiness industry. What I usually leave out is another highlight and a low light, I call it both that uh, after our successful exit, I ran back to St. Louis to care for my mother full time. To this day, I, I really don't know how I did it. Managing the startup in Asia, caring for my mother. Um, I venture to say though, that there are many women who are listening out there now today that also don't know how they did it, balancing all to achieve what they have achieved. Um, I was starting to figure out what I was going to do next while in St. Louis and met Larry Taylor, who's now the co-founder with me on this fund, and Thad Simons, who's venture partner. Um, Thad had, had just created the Yield Lab, which wasn't his intent. Uh, originally, he, when he, he was a CEO who retired from Novus International as part of uh, Mitsui, which is headquartered in St. Louis, he was gonna create an ag tech fund. Um, there was not much deal flow in 2015, as there was no early stage mechanism, which made sense for agriculture. Um, as a matter of fact, um, if I can just show a slide here. So this is how we actually started, um, which was in, in North America. We're now in Europe. We've achieved our 60 million US dollar close. Um, in Latin America, working on that fund there now for 30 million, already closing a smaller fund, doing early stage investment. Uh, Latin, uh, in Asia Pacific, registered late 2019. And then we're looking at Africa. We also have a, a not-for-profit, uh, oh, which is the Yield Lab Institute. The Yield Lab Institute is focusing on um, stimulating innovation in areas of, of agriculture, which are light in innovation. So. So areas such as aquaculture, for example, we're leading an aquaculture challenge um, out of Asia Pacific as a non-equity taking challenge and we're doing it to bubble up innovation. In some cases there's been, um, they've had some, these companies have had some investment um, in many of the cases of the 180 applications we received, uh, a good majority of those top 80 had not received any investment, maybe grants. Um, and they were focused on other species. You know, salmon is a very highly financed industry, um, but the rest of the species, not so much. 
Um, so so the, the Institute is there to be able to kind of do a pre thing to what we do in our, what would I call late early stage investment. Um, we're doing seed and series A investment and, and everything that we focus on is always focused on um, innovation that has registratable uh, intellectual property. It doesn't mean that it's already been registered, but it has the potential to be. But kind of back to the, the, the state of the industry, um, let me put it on a slideshow. So the, the, the state of the industry is that, that right now uh, in 2015 when we started, as you can see, not much deal flow. And even now, if you look at, this out of the way, if you look at 2020, I mean, a, a lot more deals clearly that have happened over the years in ag tech, which is fantastic. But still, it's a, it's a far cry from, from where we, you know, the rest of the industry is. So, you know, I, I think uh, it was $4 billion for ag tech investments for the full year of 2020, which is still just a fraction of the 300 billion globally across all sectors. Um, and if you look at this in a different way, um, you can see that, that of, of uh, Q1, just looking at the first quarter in the US, 2021, there were 381 ag tech investments, which is great. I mean, so much better than in 2015, but it's really so small in contrast to against the industry in regards to just the internet industry, which had over 25,000 deals in that same quarter. So, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot more that could be done to, and there's, there's, there's room for everyone in the space of ag tech and, it's, and, and, and happily it's getting it, its due, you know, and its attention. And, you know, what we focus on at the Yale Lab is advancing, as I mentioned, late early stage innovation across all of agriculture. So uh, crop science, precision ag, animal health, sustainability, traceability, food ingredients, all of it. The, you know, I wish we could come up with a different term than accelerator because it is, is very much not what we do. Um, we, are, we are not a fixed classroom. We're not a short process. We're not a five, six month. We are a very deep subject matter expert aligned, we go on forever. We, our obligations to these companies may just be, if it's a seed stage investment a year, still much longer than most, but we really continue on with these companies. Um, so, but in the early days of reason why the ELEB was created is because the model for accelerators that was built in Silicon Valley was much more internet tech related. So more of a you know, small amount of investment and hopefully, you know, some help in your business plan and your overall business processes. Um, but it's small seed funding and then, then, you know, out the door you go. So, but everything in agriculture is tied to a growing season. You just can't rush it. Um, and all of the pillars I mentioned, you know, crop production, precision ag, animal health, all of them, they're all interconnected. So you need more time, but more importantly, since innovation is required deep within those pillars, you need relevant subject matter experts who can understand and, and the, the importance or significance of the innovation um, to even know of something that we should be working with before we even bring them in to a short list in, in considering for our funds and then help these companies go through to commercialization. That, hence the reason why the Yield Lab was created, was to, to set up a, 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 a vehicle to be able to do that. The tie-in to my career, going back to me, <laughs> introducing my, my very long introduction of myself, is we are still in the information age, uh, now called the digital age, and the great digitization of agriculture is happening. I have, have been on both sides as an investor and an acquirer responsible for commercializing new technology and 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 also have worked for startup with a successful exit. It, it is, it's out of the necessity that the Yield Lab was created. Humans have pushed our natural resources beyond their limit. We know if we're going to be able to sustain our society, we need to circle back to this, this amazing um, yet very old 10,000 year old industry, which in itself because of the advancements in agriculture allowed for the industrial age and the industrial age then drove to the information age. So they're all interconnected, but now looking for more sustainable ways to produce more with less. And um, agriculture is, is really that last trillion dollar industry remaining to be transformed. And, 
and I'm really glad that I can play a small role in this necessary transformation. But it's, uh, it, it's, it's not easy work. Um, you know, uh, if, we're, if we're really going to truly transform this industry through science and expertise, we're going to have to find new ways to create innovate, innovative efficiencies. And this means collaborating with cross-industry technology applications. This means investments focused on financial, social, and environmental outcomes and producers developing new and innovative techniques. There, there's just absolutely no easy button. If you don't advance the early stage of these companies, we're just never gonna make it. It's the early stage is, is the most challenging part. It's the most fragile. There's multiple valleys of death that, that the startups will go through getting to this journey, which it's not just about you know venture capital funding and handholding. It's about really getting underneath the, the science areas that they've identified as being their, their um, unique intellectual property and helping them through to the other side. But it's a, it's a great balancing act. Um, sorry, I came off of full screen. Um, so, you know, <laughs> you can't, if you're gonna, if you meet it and you're really gonna <laughs> get enough food on this planet to sustain, you know, 10 billion people in, in, a, in a couple of decades, you've got to, uh, embrace the fact that agriculture uses up the majority of the, the, the natural resources in regards to water especially, and that food waste is a real challenge, and it's not at the consumer end, it's all along the supply chain. You know, uh, in Singapore, we have the 30 and 30 initiative, which is to be 30% self-sufficient in 30 years, but what about that other 70%? So so it's important to, to look at food from the, from the point of, of, of of creation at the farmer level, that's where the waste begins to happen all the way through the supply chain to the final the final consumer and beyond that, what happens after that. And then environmental change, we can't, we can't change it in the, in the near term, but we can adapt to it. Um, and then demographics, you can't totally disrupt the, the ecosystem and throw you know 28% of the world's population out of the way they make a living, which is either in farming or with and through agribusiness of some sort. Uh, and, uh, and nothing could be more impactful. Um, you know, I know impact uh, investing and in measurement has become a topic of discussion, but to be honest, everything in ag tech is about impact because it's all about driving inefficiencies out and being able to find uh, new ways to do more with less. And as you do more with less, uh, bringing the planet, the people, and, and creating prosperity so there's going to be enough highly nutritious um, food on this planet for everybody. So, so the way we go about it, because you know we are global, um, it's it's important that we're able to pull these deals around the globe as fast as possible. Um, the the and I say global, we're a federation of funds, which it really isn't a monetary authority of Singapore terminology, but but it's an, an important soft thing that we do amongst our funds, in that we work together to understand the importance of the innovation that's been invested in and, and advanced in other funds of our funds and helping those those innovations to be able to get into their highest potential addressable market as fast as possible. And if you can do this with great velocity, and if you can look at agriculture as this this this, this chessboard and having all the, the, the pieces, all the uh, different spots covered with pieces, then you can of, of innovation, then we have a chance of being able to turn back this clock and to comprehensively um, uh, turn the planet back a bit so that, that we can slow down um, and, uh, and accelerate our ability to get enough food on this planet and produce in a sustainable sort of way. That's the reason why we were created. So, you know, what we do is very tightly aligned around uh, relevant industry subject matter experts. None of us are young. Um, we come with a 30 year uh, or 20 or 30 year um, background, which means we've got 20 or 30 years of relationships that we leverage um, with our potential investments. And we get them to weigh in very early. So if it's some, an innovation and in, let's say animal health, we're having a 20, 30 year immunologist that's looking at this, this innovation. And, and the, the other side benefit of that is that we're able to then um, close the gap between you know, the, the, the innovation 
and the companies that are more than likely going to maybe do a POC, invest or acquire. Most of the innovation, unless it's on the consumer front end, food tech side, is going to be acquired, is going to be at the form of exit. Um, it's going to be through an acquisition. So the closer, the faster you can get to close that gap in R&D, the better for the company and the better for the world. Um, and you can free up those other 100 people focus, focusing on the same problem to, to be able to, those intelligent people to focus on something else. We provide a bigger ticket amount for investment, and we always make sure that, that the ones that understand the industry the most, the producers and the innovators out in the field are involved. When we started putting together the Yield Lab, we looked at uh, the study that was done by the Kauffman Foundation that said that funds that were managed by subject matter experts were four times more likely to achieve exceptional results. And we thought, hey, it seems like we're on the right track. Now, um, you know, six years later, these are our results. Just the early stage investment, so if you just talk about the seed stage investment, um, ha has driven 40, 54 times, over 50 times in follow on investment. Um, and an unrealized return of between 18 to 22% on our funds. And I say unrealized because until you have a hard exit, you're not going to know the actual IRR. We've already now, it's about right. Uh, it's usually an exit in ag tech is between six to eight years. And we have uh, already started um, uh, receiving exits or achieving exits. Uh, last year, we had two companies and another one already this year, hard exits through acquisition. Um, and we see a great deal of deal flow. So since, since we started, we received thousands of deals and we've selected less than 3%. And the stuff that we leave on the cutting floor is pretty fantastic. So our investors and us get a chance of getting access to that curated deal flow and acting upon it if they wish from a co-investment perspective. So we're regional and we're global. So why this is important is because each region has its own challenges. Um, in Asia Pacific, there's, there's challenges now in food safety and sustainability and from the environment perspective, but you really can't say North America has a, a huge food safety issue. So each, each region, Europe, Latin America, and Asia Pacific have different challenges. This is also a massive smallholder farming um, region. And so it's extremely important that innovation is, is made that can, can be leveraged across the, the smallholders um, in a way that is, can be monetized, because it's not going to be monetized through the smallholders. They have no money. And no smallholder wants to be a smallholder. So as fast as we can get them to where they make a little bit more money, they can get a little bit more land, they get another animal um, and, and advance into some other crops, then they can get out of being a smallholder. So anyway, if we can do this in a comprehensive way, aligning the high impact uh, that these ag, ag tech startups and pain points with, with, it, with the rest of the globe and the total addressable market, we then, in a comprehensive way, have a chance of solving this unsolvable equation um, of getting enough, enough food on this planet with using less resources. Um, this is just to, to illustrate the point that, you know, we do have subject matter experts across the, the regions that are aligned by expertise, science area, as well as the residency. You could argue the point that a thought leader, um, it, it, it could be global. It doesn't really matter where they, where they reside. And we've never been at residential in anything we do. So, um, but this is just to illustrate the point as far as the, uh, the uh, uh, subject matter expertise that we have access to. So if you were to look at the yield lab where this cog, this wheel that is, begins moving faster and faster um, it's made up of, of uh, science, innovators, thought leaderships, academia. And as we go faster and faster, we're at 50, over 50 companies now. We'll be close to 90 next year and, you know, it, and in the hundreds the year after. But it's not about the quantity. It's about the fact that we are comprehensively covering off all different aspects of agriculture. And the right side is just to demonstrate how we do what we do identifying around the regional food systems, being able to then uh, identify those areas or gaps that need focus on either from investment and in, in, in the lab funds or from uh, our not-for-profit uh, perspective, align with those science and subject matter experts that we're going to have take them through the process or be with them and help them, whether it could be horizontal or vertical um, thought leaders, um, start to select uh, and then commercialize and get them as fast as possible into their their um, total addressable market with velocity. 
and this is some of our companies. I'm going to do a time check and see how I'm doing. Um, you know, I could take you through a couple of these if that. Uh, yeah, it's sense. fine. It's, it's fine. Clear. You're having time on your. So okay. Please, please carry on. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, let's start from like our early years. Um, in 2015, one of our companies in our first cohort, um, it's Treviva. Treviva um, is an innovation based on the Pangamia tree, very relevant for India because it's all over India. Um, it's called the Mempari here in Singapore. It's a tree that, that grows a, a legume or a bean, which is very bitter to eat. And what these innovators have found a way is to extract the bitterness from the bean and, and create a high protein, 50% protein cooking oil. And in this way, monetizing a, a, a tree that had never been used for anything. I think the, maybe it's in the original book of Arrivida. It's an essential oil, and that's it. And, and um, it's, a, it's a tree that's carbon negative. It allows for reforestation. It's productive for 35, 40 years. It handles periodic drought and flooding. Um, and so it's a pretty hardy um, scenario. And they also have a high protein flour that they, that they have um, uh, extracted. There's no leftover cake or residue that has to be dealt with. As in palm, it's very safe to harvest. You just use a regular peanut shaker. And the company is now valued at, at over 100, 150 million. And it just went through uh, its Series E round. Um, other companies that, that have had large rounds recently is Biotech, just had a $147 million round in the, in the last couple of months, two months ago. Um, in our region, just to be relevant to, to India and Asia, um, we have in our portfolio an Asia Pacific Fossil, which is doing um, microclimate um, data and predictive and prescriptive analytics using a sensor, which is patented, which is affordable and and a person can just install it, needs so those servicing. Um, they're, they're going crop by crop and this big data uh, accumulation, um, starting with grapes, capsicum, pomegranate, um, as they go. Uh, and um, fossils going through its another round right now. Um, they're already generating, uh, I think, 50,000 a month in revenue and have done really fantastic in their growth. Um, uh, Credit AI, which is a smallholder farmer solution, um, for credit, getting accredited loans from um, actual institutions as a, as a vehicle to, to allow farmers, smallholder farmers, to be known uh, and credit worthy. Right now, that's the problem. There's a billion dollar market that the banks would love to access, but you know, there's such a high credit risk because these are unknown entities. And through, through the capture of historical and current and future information and using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, being able to back into a credit rating for these small holders. Um, there's something in it for everyone. The bankers then are assured that their their un loan is being used for the purpose that it was um, applied and that they have to deploy that uh, that loan through the FPO. Um, FPO was for all the farmer farming in, uh, uh, needs would it be for fertilizer or seeds, would be through the FPO, through a smart card or their smartphone. Um, in this way, the banker knows that the money is being used for what it was um, applied for and, the, and also ensures a high repayment rate. Um, and there's something for everybody in this, their value proposition for the banks, for the FPOs getting a CRM solution and for the, the smallholders being able to get the loans. Um, Oh gosh, I could go on. So you probably don't need me to. But in animal health, we have EIO Diagnostics, which is um, uh, doing utter mass diet, detecting easily, detecting in a, I'm sorry, effectively and inexpensively detecting utter mastitis in cows and goats. So it's an inexpensive way to be able to detect something before it goes paired shape and and scar tissue is. Uh, is happening in, in the cow or the goat. Once there's scar tissue, milk production stops and that, that animal is no longer able to produce. Um, yeah, so that's just to give you a little snapshot of, of what we're doing. Um, like I mentioned, you know, a lot of women, I mean, I don't know how that happened, but so we have in our fund, we actually, first time ever, I'm, you know, it's just they were the right people for the roles and um, I'm really happy about that, but it wasn't by design. And it's just that these are the, the most skilled individuals. Michelle Chi, who's an experienced uh, fund manager, 
having worked for Evia Capital and, and um, uh, has had experience across this region, region managing a $100 million fund. Nancy Lowe, who is a, a proven entrepreneur herself, a background in the technology industry. Sophie Guo, whose uh, experience is originally technology, but she's got her, her education in circular economy from Wharton and also has an affinity towards aquaculture and microalgae. Um, some great venture partners that are, you know, in Silicon Valley, um, uh, Kevin Chen, who's got his PhD at MIT um, and was, and actually was involved with uh, crop enhancement as a CEO and turned that company through a series B round. So that was his ag tech involvement. Um, and the, he really loves ag tech. That's why he's involved with us because he's, he's also doing another fund, which is deep tech. Amir Mahatir, who is a uh, background in technology and has his own fund as well and a background in supply chain and logistics. So great people. Now, now the men start showing up. Okay, morning, yeah, men alert. So we got, we got men showing up in, in North America, but these are really clever guys uh, <laughs> that come out. Juan Ferrer was the number three guy at Monsanto and is now the head of strategy for Sumitomo. Uh, uh, Pat Pinkston was CIO at John Deere. Bob Norgren is a, a lifelong um, uh, immunologist. His, he's a C-level executive at Muriel. So some really fantastic people, and that's what makes us roll. I mean, what, what makes us roll is our investors, our general partners that are, you know, have, bring in the, the, the subject matter experts that we need when we need them. Our network is vast, hundreds um, globally around everything from tropical plant science to water technology um, to aquaculture. Uh, our, our investments make up our, our ecosystem and also all of our different funds and our, uh, and, um, our investors. So that's us. I gave you a speed talk of, of the Yield Lab. I hope that that resonates with some of you, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Deepa. Thanks, Arat. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to have like, you know, very insightful discussion and uh, the whole idea of Yield Lab and uh, having subject matter experts helping the startup. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of the time to have question answer session because I didn't want it to like you know interrupt uh, your flow. So thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, like you know, it, it was a pleasure having you as a speaker for this awesome event, Women in Agriculture Web Summit. Thanks, thanks Thank a lot. Thank you so much for inviting Thank me. You. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. My, my pleasure.